Coming up, a Philadelphia hero saving her community in the midst of corona crisis. My mom used to say, there's no such word as can. When life hands out lemons, this young man is handing out lemonade. I feel really good because I love helping people. Rodney McLeod has made helping people his mission, and it's personal. Cancer took her from this earth way too soon. It's time to reach for the stars while connecting the past and future of our country, as well as our country's favorite pastime, with voices that are loud and proud. This is our NBC10 special, Celebrating Black Excellence. NBC10 presents Celebrating Black Excellence, supported by TD Bank. Hello and welcome to our NBC10 special, Celebrating Black Excellence. I'm Jim Rosenfield. And I'm Jacqueline London. Some people are made for tough times. Dr. Ayla Stanford is one of them. When the pandemic hit, the Philly born pediatric surgeon knew who to help and how. NBC10's Mitch Blocker has her amazing story. If you don't get a call from us, that means you don't have it. Dr. Ayla Stanford's drive through clinics are the reason tens of thousands of Philadelphians got a COVID test and will eventually get vaccinated. What has grown into line spanning blocks began with a single van. Tested 12 people. Yep, 12 that day. And it took all day. Stanford's mom rented the van, her husband drove it, her pastor scheduled the tests. <laughs> These were the early days of the pandemic, and this board certified Philly born pediatric surgeon was making house calls. The two things you needed most were testing and contact tracing, and I could do that. And she was qualified to do more than test and trace. She knew the barriers to health care. What if they don't have insurance? Well, who's going to pay for it? Because along with her brother, she grew up hurdling them. We were on welfare, they call it public assistance now. We had our coupon books with the food stamps in it. Ayla Stanford grew up in Germantown in public housing. Heat on a winter night, she told us, was a luxury back then. You don't know how poor you are till someone points it out. Stanford was 10 years old at a Philly public health clinic when she noticed what was possible. It's when the founder of the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium met her first black doctor. I was trying to figure out how did this black woman get all the, like she i mean she looked really nice like and i don't and i don't think i had ever seen a black woman like that professional so stanford started studying this was definitely the cafeteria she took us back to the philadelphia public school that stoked her love for math and science her grades were so good she got to spend one day a week at drexel university it was a totally different world over there Everything was clean. There wasn't garbage all over the place. You were walking on this college campus. And I thought, man, so this is what college looks like. Okay. And those things stuck in my mind because that's what I wanted. Work study programs and academic scholarship paid her tuition to Penn State. She had the grades and desire to go to medical school, but not enough money to take the entrance exam. During a holiday break home in Philly, she told her friends and family. One of the elders just took a hat off and passed it around the room. And, um, and everyone started to put in $5, coins, checks, whatever they had. And I took that money back to Penn State and I was accepted into medical school. A hat full of $1,200 and her own hard work made her Dr. Stanford. She trained in Brooklyn and Cincinnati and then came home to practice at Temple University Hospital. In 2020, the people who passed that hat around needed a doctor and Philly's 10-year-old girls a role model. That's a real full circle moment. In Philadelphia, I'm Mitch Blocker, NBC10 News. Derek Pitts is the Franklin Institute. That's actually on his bio at the Popular Science and Tech Museum here in Philadelphia. He's made science cool, a fascination with the universe that began as a young boy in North Philadelphia. When I think back on it, I have always been curious about the natural world. Derek Pitts' curiosity about science began as a kid on this block of Pacific Street in the nice town Tioga section of Philadelphia. I've always wanted to try to understand why is that the way it is? How does that work? Did that drive your parents a little crazy? <laughs> Did you 
lot of questions. Yeah, it did. Did you have role models at school who kind of nurtured your curiosity? I had a science teacher named Beth Schoel. She was my eighth grade science teacher. She really lit the fire in me to pursue a career in science because she was a chemist. She wasn't just a teacher, she was an actual chemist. So I would put on science demonstrations for all the students in the school at assembly programs. And blew things up. Yeah, I would make volcanoes and demonstrate <laughs> you know, how flares worked and you know all sorts of things like that. Were there role models beyond school that you looked to or were they difficult to find? They were extremely difficult to find. I was gonna give you a one word answer, no, but they were extremely difficult to find. I could not point to a scientist of color that I knew of at the time that was in my community. Pitt's father, though, was a radar technician for the Air Force. Lift off. And it was space exploration, missions he saw on TV, that really sent his dreams aloft. I would have preferred to be an astronaut. That's what I really wanted to do. I really wanted to go to space. But Pitt's love of the universe helped him soar in his own way, becoming the chief astronomer and planetarium director at the Franklin Institute, where he's worked for more than four decades. We can see that Mars is dead ahead right there. You can see it without any difficulty at all. Named one of the 50 most important blacks in research science with a Twitter handle, at Cool Astronomer. It's nice to see you. I haven't seen you since I was in the Franklin Institute. Thanks for straightening, thanks for straightening that out about where it is. It's in Philadelphia. Yeah. Yeah, good. Anxious to spread his love of science to a broad audience. Talk to me about what the best part of your job is at the Institute, would you say? The best part of my job at the Franklin Institute is sharing my enthusiasm about science. The people that I encounter, I want them to understand. I want them to feel empowered that they too can understand complex science. But here are the winter constellations right over here in the southeastern portion of the sky. It's not just for some egghead, it's for you too. Known as a founding father, Thomas Jefferson had a huge imprint on our country. He signed the Declaration of Independence and became the nation's third president. But there's also a side of history that's not often mentioned. Jefferson had children with one of the black slaves he owned, a sixth generation descendant who lives here in Philadelphia. He shared his story with NBC 10's Brandon Hudson. No justice! Why are you in riot here? Last summer, America came face to face with the ugly divide within its borders. Don't shoot. Protests turned confrontations fueled by race relations, rooted in the history of enslaved black people and their white owners. I'm a product of both slave and slave owner. Uh, I am as American as you get. At the Black Reserve Bookstore in Lansdale, where black history lives on the shelves, we sat down with W. Douglas Banks, a Philadelphia pastor and a relative of Thomas Jefferson. I would be able to stand, and at that time I would count the greats. I would say Thomas Jefferson is my great, 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 great grandfather. You heard right. Banks, a black man, is related to the third president of the United States. Jefferson also owned enslaved people, including Sally Hemings, whom he had children with. So it was very important for my mother to share our roots. Do you feel conflicted in any way? Oh, absolutely. While there are no known photos and little history about Hemings, here's what we know. A maid to Jefferson's daughters, Hemings had six children with Thomas Jefferson. Of the four who became adults, three identified as white. Hemings lived to be in her 60s, spending her final 13 years as a free person. And I can remember standing up in class uh, in my all-white school where I was the only uh, black kid in the school and saying, Thomas Jefferson is my great, 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 great grandfather and everybody laughing me to scorn, including the teacher. Although ridiculed as a child, Banks flipped the script decades later, sharing his truth on a bigger stage. Last July 4th, the preacher was invited to speak at the annual Liberty Bell Tapping Ceremony. He didn't sugarcoat his history. I am a sixth generation descendant of third president of the United States and slave that he raped by the name of Sally Hemings. I won't get invited back. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you gave a speech that more or less ruffled some feathers. Yeah, and that was an extremely um, necessary moment for me, particularly in the time period where we were uh, in July of last year with all the racial unrest that was going on. 
After 2020's racial reckoning, W. Douglas Banks believes now it is more critical than ever to discuss the divide in this country. It's got to have an honest, honest, uh, reflective and truthful coming to understand the truth about ourselves. Advice from a black man who's reconciled his past and is an example of how America can evolve to educate its future. For our celebration of black excellence, Brandon Hudson, NBC 10 News. Still to come, you know Rodney McLeod's work on the field, but it's his tireless work off the field that's brought him a huge honor. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. And we are a black-owned talk radio station. Sarah Lomax Reese is leading the way as a leading voice for Pennsylvania's only African-American-owned talk radio station. Her story, next. NBC 10 presents Celebrating Black Excellence. TD Bank is proud to amplify the voices and stories of black communities this month and every month after. Welcome back. Rodney McLeod has been the center of attention for his on-field play. This year, the Eagles' safety earned a well-deserved honor for his work off the field. NBC Sports Philadelphia's Danny Pamels has more on the inspiration that motivates him. You can't just talk the talk. You must walk the walk. It's hard to imagine a player walking that walk more than Eagle safety Rodney McLeod. Let me get two claps to the rip there. Woo! What's going on, man? How you doing, Have sir? Two, three. Rodney earned the highest off the field honor in football this year. He's the Eagles Walter Payton Man of the Year nominee. It was a good feeling for the team to select me and to represent uh, the team the right way and, and because of my work that I've done uh, throughout my time here in Philadelphia. Oh my goodness, thank you. This year, Rodney's Change Our Future Foundation sponsored 12 consecutive days of Christmas giveaways to assist families in the most trying year. Thank you so much, Rodney. Oh, you're a true blessing. I hope the injury, you get much better. Please, we need you. Injuries don't clip Rodney's wings. This eagle soars and uplifts our community. His inspiration is personal. That's Katherine Graham, my grandmother, my nana. Cancer took her from this earth way too soon. In high school, I cried many times watching her struggle. I vowed to use my voice, my platform, to help others avoid the hurt and the pain that I felt. And it's with kids that Rodney truly is changing the game. Honestly, we're forming leaders for, of tomorrow. Rodney's Game Changers Initiative provides lifelong learning for kids. 2020 has really opened the eyes of a lot of us and, and, and where we need to be more informed. Rodney organized teammates to get Philadelphians to vote, one of his proudest accomplishments. Knowing that we played a role in such an impactful election, man, just felt encouraging. And in the toughest of times, we always find a way to rise up. The Rise Up for Research campaign brings me back to my inspiration, my grandmother and the ongoing quest to eradicate cancer once and for all. I'm paying it forward to thank all the people who made me the man who I am today. And I'm laying the foundation so that the next generation take the vision to the next level. We all can be game changers. We all we got, we all we need. One, two, three, four, five, six, four, five, six, six, four, six. For our celebration of black excellence, Danny Pommels, NBC Sports, The Little. Rodney McLeod certainly makes his voice heard, as does Sarah Lomax Reese, a trailblazer ensuring all voices have a platform. It's making me think about things differently from the way I've ever thought about them before. Look forward to inviting our entire audience to Good join Good morning, us. Mrs. Solomon Jones. While the revolution will not be televised, it is on the radio. Letting our voices be heard through word. A rare platform in our own backyard. WURD Radio in Philadelphia is one of only three black owned talk radio stations in the nation. President and CEO Sarah Lomax Reese says it's needed now more than ever. I think it's absolutely pivotal to have spaces that are owned and controlled by black people in this moment because we need uh, unique opportunities to speak and be heard in our own voice and to be able to control the narrative. 
Dr. Walter Lomax Jr. was a well-known Philadelphia physician and local trailblazer. He acquired Word Radio in 2002. His daughter, Sarah Lomax Reese, has been at the helm since 2010. She says the success of the station and its evolution over nearly 20 years is a testament to the city of brotherly love. It's a very difficult business model to sustain. We're fortunate to be in a city like Philadelphia that is almost 45% black, where there is a community that really understands and, and values uh, talk radio and black spaces and black media. In 2020, the narrative was dark and difficult. The pandemic, pleas for justice and politics, voices that needed a platform to be heard. Race and racism is not going away anytime soon. And so we need to have places like WURD that give people the agency to come up with strategies to address systemic racism, but also to celebrate the wins and the successes and the unique uh, opportunities that exist in our community. And now Ms. Lomax Reese says the conversation needs to be on ownership in media for there to be real change. My hope is that the corporate community and, and all of these stakeholders, they don't get fatigued, really stay committed to addressing this 400 year old cancer that's been a part of American society in terms of anti-black racism and really puts the money and the resources and, and the time, because this is a long-term solution. Still to come. A South Jersey coach is the living embodiment of baseball's past being connected with the game's future. That story coming out. Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier 74 years ago, signing with the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1945. Shortly after, a pitcher named Roy Partlow became the third Negro Leagues player to sign with a big league club. Roy, though, never made it to the bigs. He died in 1987. But his baseball legacy lives on in Cherry Hill. Pam Osborne has the story. You know you got a big task this year. We're going to need you to throw, man. I, I need you to lead the way. On the baseball fields at Cherry Hill East High School, Jason Speller is leading the way. Enjoy every single day that you're here because what happens is it goes by like that. Sometimes you just minimize those a few little things, get that leg kick out of there, it allows you to get your back to the zone. Jason is the head baseball coach for the Cougars. Coach Spell's the best, man. There you go. Not only does he make us great baseball players, but from sophomore year up until now, he's made us all grown into really good young men as well. He's been in baseball his whole life, and his connection to the game dates back decades before he was born to his late grandfather, Roy Partlow. He played on the 1939 Negro League All-Star team with some of the greatest baseball players of all time, no matter what color they were. Jason's grandfather, Roy, was a Negro League All-Star, playing with names like Satchel Paige, Josh Gibson, and Jackie Robinson. Growing up, I never really put it into perspective. So I never really thought, oh man, he shared, the, he shared the field with Jackie Robinson. Like Jackie, Roy signed with the Brooklyn organization. Like Jackie, he faced awful discrimination. That's not a situation that's easy for a lot of people because when you're in that situation, you know, you have a lot of people that are directing hate towards you and just because of the color of your skin. Jason keeps his connection to baseball's past close to his heart and close to the vest. You know, I've, I've never really sat and talked to my kids about my grandfather. I really haven't. I've, I've never really talked to my players about my grandfather. But I just talked to them about, you know, having love for the game. You know, you're out here because you love it. That's crazy. You never, like, bragged about it or anything. But it's just, that's really cool that he knows someone close to him that had that much of an impact. The accomplishments of Negro League stars like Roy are memorialized across our area. Now Jason carries their legacy and their spirit. He's jacked about the games. He's excited. He's full of compassion. He's locked in for sure. Cherish every second that you're here. Remember it. Put all your effort in. Put everything. Give the game everything you got and enjoy it. Just over six weeks ago, Major League Baseball elevated Roy and every Negro Leagues player to Major League status. So their records will forever live on in Major League history. 
And while his sats live on in books, his legacy, that lives on in his grandson. I'm Pamela Osborne, NBC 10 News. Up next. We feel really good because I love helping people. His amazing story wraps up this celebration of black excellence. Next. NBC 10 celebrates black excellence. Sharice McGill started French Toast Bites after leaving her day job at Montgomery County Community College. What started out as freshly made treats has now found its way into the beer scene, making Sharice the first African-American woman in Pennsylvania to release her own draft beer. Celebrate black excellence. Download the NBC 10 app on Apple and Roku TV. TD Bank is proud to amplify the voices and stories of black communities this month and every month after. The taste of sweet success has a 10-year-old in South Philadelphia taking his lemonade stand to the next level. His business is so popular, he's putting it on wheels, buying a small bus to use for sales. NBC 10's Drew Smith takes us aboard. You might think a 10-year-old would only be getting on a bus like this to go to school. But Micah Heron has different plans for this space. We're going to try to take these seats out and then place them the coolers. The South Philly kid behind Micah's mix is moving his lemonade business into the next gear. So it can take us a lot of places easier and quicker. He's created more than 12 flavors. Since I love lemonade, I decided to make lemonade into my business. And it quickly became a hit over the summer as he set up his stand near his home or at pop-ups. It kind of skyrocketed. I always tell him, whatever you want to do, kid. Within reason, whatever you want to do. Micah's clearly not old enough to drive, so his mom, Danielle, will take care of that. I've never driven a bus, but, you know, you do anything for your kids. They bought this with the cash he earned. I did a little bit of research on investing. But it's about more than just profit. Micah launched a charity effort to give out lemonade to the homeless. I feel really good because I love helping people. The bus will help with adding some food to the mix. So that you can see the menu while you're ordering gaining life lessons along the way. I just always knew he would do something with his life. The only thing I'm surprised about is that he did it at 10 and not like 30. And it's so big, I just can't stop. It just feels great. They still have some money to raise, and then it's going to take a month to retrofit the bus. But by March, this could be rolling around the streets of Philly. I'm Drew Smith, NBC 10 News. The bus will have a takeout window, refrigerators, and sinks. <laughs> Micah and his mom are also studying how to meet city code and get licensed. Very important. Thank you for watching. Our celebration of black excellence continues on our website, NBC10.com, and our mobile app. Have a great night.